Do you often wonder, is the stock market overvalued, undervalued, or priced just about right? And how can we use that information to help us with our investments or trades? If those are questions that you have, stay tuned, I have some answers for you. Before I start on this video, I want to remind you that I have a free workshop that is available to you by clicking on the link in the description box below this video. It's about 90 minutes long. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just trying to offer you some insight and different ways that I think and to help you possibly think in different ways yourself. The coverage includes a lot of different areas. Of course, I talk about the financial markets in general and a little bit about the stock market itself. I also cover sports. I'm a big fan of sports. Music. I've been playing music since I was very young. And I also talk about professional and personal relationships. The goal of this workshop is to help you to think in either new or different ways as well as for you to get to know me and my style. This is part three in a series of videos about stock market valuation. If this is the first video in the series that you're watching, it might be to your benefit to go back and look at parts one and two. In this discussion, we'll be talking about a thing called the yield curve model. This is part three of a series, and I think there'll be about seven parts when I get this all done, but I could expand or contract that. I'm not really sure at this point. What we do is we use tools to determine if the stock market is overvalued, or another term that we often use is expensive, undervalued or cheap, or fairly valued. The idea is you want to buy stocks or buy indexes or look at the stock market when prices are considered cheap. On the other hand, when prices become expensive or overvalued, then that might be a time when you want to consider selling those investments or selling that index or changing your approach to the stock market. This is just one tool that we can use among a whole host of other tools that help us to determine what is the current situation of the stock market and what is the likely future situation of the stock market. In this video, I'm going to talk about a useful website called Current Market Valuation. And here is their web address, and I'll put this in the description below the video here. This is a pretty useful site, and it's freely available. You don't have to join anything or pay anything to have access to their information, and it's really quite helpful. Here is the actual website at currentmarketvaluation.com. They come to an overall consensus. At the top, we see where prices are overvalued right now when we're taking a number of different models into consideration. If we scroll down just a little bit, this is the model that we're talking about in this video. It's called the yield curve model. Right now, current market valuation has this listed as fairly valued. There are other models that are used, and I have videos that talk about each one of these different models. This can include the Buffett indicator model, which is suggesting that things are strongly overvalued. We also have the P.E. ratio model, which I talked about in the previous video, and that is strongly overvalued right now. Then there's also the S&P 500 mean reversion model, and I explained that in the accompanying video. And then the last model that they use on this website is the interest rate model, which is currently showing that things are also fairly valued. So when we look at bonds, the markets are looking okay. Even though inflation is really starting to rise as I record this, interest rates are very low. So when you compare what you're getting as far as the yield compared to inflation, you're actually losing money at that point. But looking from a historical context, bonds and interest rates are fairly valued. They're not extreme, either high or low right now, as far as it relates to the market. They may be very low as far as it relates to you and the returns that you seek. So just what is the yield curve model? It's really not all that complicated, but if this is new to you, it might be a little bit strange. 
What we do is we take the yield or the interest rate that's attached to the 10-year treasury bond. That's the benchmark bond that most countries use, especially to do an apples to apples comparison. What is the 10-year yield in the US compared to that in Germany or in Japan or in other countries? That gives us a good evaluation point. We also look at a thing called the three-month treasury yield. This is the interest rate that you would receive if you tied up your money for three months, bought a government bond, you not only will get your money back at the end of that three months, you'll also get interest in addition to that. And what we do for this model is we take the 10-year treasury yield and then we subtract the three-month treasury yield and that gives us what's called the yield spread. What's the difference between the two? You might think, well, how in the world can this help me? Well, stay tuned in this video and I'll show you how looking at this yield spread can give us some insight as to what is happening in the economy and in the stock market. If we get a result, if we take the 10 minus the 3 and that result is positive, a positive number, that is usually bullish, which means we're looking at things to go up. The economy may be improving, the stock market is usually in an uptrend at that point, so we overall are bullish on things. This usually means economic growth. If we take the 10 and subtract the 3 and we get a negative yield, that is bearish or negative. It's usually, not always, but usually followed by a recession. Every time we get this signal does not necessarily mean there will be a recession, but every time we've had a recession, this signal has always come before that. So if we do get a signal, which we're not getting right now as I record this, we just want to be watchful. One thing that you may have heard about before is a thing called a recession. Well, what is that? It's when we take the GDP or the gross domestic product. That's the biggest measurement of an economy. And the U.S. puts this out every quarter. So it doesn't come out every month, even though there are preliminary reports and post pre and then there's the report itself and then we get the revised report so pretty much every month we do get some kind of GDP numbers thrown at us but the actual report comes out every quarter so four times each year or every three months when you have a decline for two consecutive quarters back to back that is the definition of a recession that means we have negative growth. So let's look a little bit more at a recession. An inverted yield curve, which means the short-term interest rate is higher than the long-term interest rate. This produces what's called an inverted yield curve, and it usually precedes a recession, negative GDP growth, by about six to 18 months. One of the things to be aware of is this usually makes big news in the financial media. You'll read about it online, You'll hear about it on any of the financial channels. People will be talking about it. The thing that's different about this is they usually make a big deal of it at the time. But since the media and most people have such a short attention span, by the time this really kicks into gear, it's forgotten about. It's like, oh yeah, we did go negative 6, 8, 12 months ago. And now we're seeing a recession. Just as an example, in the summer of... 2019 in August and I'll show you some charts here in a minute we went negative with the yield curve well at that time the general public didn't know anything about COVID-19 well sure enough other news came in to take the place of this news it pretty much was forgotten about well then what happened in early 2020 that's when the pandemic hit everything stopped we got thrown into a recession, but by then it was considered to be old news or irrelevant news or what's most likely is forgotten news. So once we register one of these, we want to keep a watch on things. The financial markets, specifically the bond market, is very good at anticipating the future. They didn't know what was going to happen necessarily in the summer of 2019. This would be three or four months after this when the pandemic really started to hit the U.S., it was happening in Asia and in other countries. It hadn't become the big thing. So what I do in the videos that I make every day and every week and every month, once we register one of these, we keep an eye on it. Doesn't mean that we're going to change things right away. It just means we're on recession warning. Because we don't want to lose sight of this and then forget about it and then be caught off guard if things do end up changing. And recessions usually produce stock market declines. 
We had a recession in 2000. This was preceded by an inverted yield curve in the late 90s. We had one before the housing meltdown in 2008 into 2009. And we had one before the COVID-19 pandemic. We may not know what is going to happen, but we just need to watch for something to happen that will fulfill the justification of the markets going ahead and selling off instead of continuing to go up. Just to give you an example, here is a chart that I took from tradingeconomics.com. This is just GDP growth going back to the mid 90s. Anytime we're above the orange line, that's positive GDP growth. Anytime we drop below that, that is negative GDP growth. We just keep an eye on this. It's nothing that we usually watch every day. I might look at it once a week, usually at least once a month. Because this is a quarterly report, we still get monthly data on the GDP, so we just want to keep an eye on this. The next chart shows what's considered to be a normal yield curve. And if you think about it, this makes sense. Over on the left-hand side, we have the three-month treasury and the corresponding yield that goes with that. And that should be lower because you're only tying up your money for three months. As we continue over to the right, we have the two-year, the five-year, the 10-year, the 20-year, and ultimately the 30-year treasury. The longer you're willing to tie up your money, the more interest rate you will likely get. And that only makes sense because there is risk involved in that. What if you got into a 30-year treasury that's paying 2% and you're riding this thing out for 30 years, all of a sudden interest rates go to 8%. Hmm, that 2% that you locked in for 30 years suddenly doesn't look very good anymore. So that's why you're given a higher interest rate off the bat. You can go in and get rid of these bonds in the secondary market and buy another one, but the bond market has become a lot more active in the last 15 to 20 years where people used to just buy them and forget about it, and we really didn't see interest rates change all that much. Well, now, my goodness, you might buy a bond today and sell it tomorrow and then be in the stock market and moving things all around as all of these hedge funds and big money managers and computer trading systems are constantly analyzing all of these numbers and then shifting from one into the other. Generally, if you are in the bond market, that is called risk off because you have an interest rate that is paid to you and these are considered to be very safe investments. If interest rates are really low and people can get a better return in the stock market, that is considered to be risk on. So you may hear those terms from time to time. Looking at the chart, we see that an upward sloping curve is throughout the entire range. And we plot this every day. And this is kind of cool and it's kind of helpful and I have some more charts that I can show you. But does this really tell us anything? We're just taking a snapshot in time for one day. We need to look at this, how it moves over a period of time. That's where we get a little bit more insight. Here's the yield curve as of July 30th. This is the most recent chart as I record this from currentmarketvaluation.com. And this shows a pretty healthy yield curve. Over on the left, you have the three month treasuries at the lowest yield all the way over to the right with the 30-year treasury having the highest yield. And that's pretty much how it should be. The longer out you go, the higher the interest rate will be. The next chart is the most recent chart that I have. Over on the left-hand side shows the current yield curve, the red line, as of August 23rd, 2021. Over on the right-hand side shows the S&P 500. And we can make some comparisons between the two. In a good, healthy environment with the stock market going up, you will generally see an upward sloping yield curve. Here is a negative yield curve. This is from August 2019, as I mentioned before. We have an inverted yield curve over on the left where short-term rates are suddenly a little bit higher than long-term rates, and we see a downslope in the curve. Instead of it going up and over, now it's going down. We didn't know what was going to happen at that time. We just saw this and went, hmm, keep that on the radar and then look at what happened after that. At currentmarketvaluation.com, they also have a chart. And I, I have this chart too, but theirs looks a little nicer than mine. So I just went ahead and used this one. This is the 10-year to three-month spread going all the way back to 1962 when we had the old Cuban Missile Crisis up to the present. When this is above zero, the chart is blue. 
When this is below zero, that means we have an inverted yield curve, and usually it means bad things are going to happen six to 18 months into the future. So negative spreads consistently are followed by a recession within one to two years. That can be as short as a few months. Like we saw, this was August 2019, and then the pandemic really broke in February of 2020. So that's about six months, but it can go longer. It can be a year, it could be a year and a half. Also in this chart, you notice that the historical average is 1.52%. We just use that as a point of reference. With other charts that I look at, I look at the current value compared to the historical average or the median or the mean. This chart, it's really just giving us a reference point. If there's one flaw in this, it may be that this is a static number. It doesn't change all that often, but it still gives us helpful information. This next chart just goes back to the year 2000. Again, we have the historical average over on the left at 1.52%. We have anything above zero being blue, anything below zero being red. The annotation that they make on this chart shows that in 2019, specifically in the summer of 2019, we had an inverted yield curve, and this was predicting a recession at that time at some point in the future. It ended up being the recession that we had in early 2020 throughout a lot of 2020. This next chart is closer to what they use for the model. The interesting thing about this chart is you have to flip it upside down. When we have very high readings, that means that there is an inverted yield curve. So it's just the opposite of the charts I've been showing you. When it drops down, that means that the yield curve is positive and may be getting too far extreme to the upside. That's not what I'm gonna focus on in this video. We're really just watching for does it drop below zero into an inverted curve. One thing that they plot on this chart are standard deviations based on the historical value. They calculate a standard deviation both above and below. I use those in other analysis that I look at, and we really just pay attention to that if we get into those areas. And then they say in the box, on July 31st, 2021, the yield curve is now in an average spread. So that means it's healthy. The conclusion that they reach is that we are fairly valued. We're not too hot, we're not too cold. We're not expensive, we're not cheap but also looking closer to the right-hand side where it really spiked up, that was when things went inverted, and that predicted the 2020 recession. The next chart just shows the S&P 500 with yield curve inversions, and what they did is they plotted them in red on the chart. We can go all the way back to the 60s for this. The ones that we pay most attention to are closer to now, so I'm looking over towards the year 2000. The recession was predicted about a year to a year and a half before it actually happened. Then we had the inverted yield curve going into the financial meltdown, and then the yield curve inversion that happened preceding the COVID-19 lockdowns and recession. In the modern era, an inverted yield curve is always closely followed by a recession. And it's generally followed by a pretty big drop in the S&P 500. So these are warning clouds that we look at into the future. The next chart is a chart that I look at and I post and I put together. And this just shows all of the different yields of all the different treasuries that we have available to us that the U.S. government issues. And what I'm looking for are when we get all botched together or lines flip over top of each other. And we can also see in this chart in the late 90s, we had this old jumble mess. Then, before the meltdown in 2008, we had another jumbled mess. And then in late 2019, we also had another jumbled mess. And I look at this every day, and I talk about this in my videos when I actually see things happening. But if you go way over to the right-hand side, we're looking pretty good. We have a pretty normal yield curve right now. This is also a chart that shows the S&P 500 at the top, and then the spread on the bottom, and I just made a red area near the bottom where it says inverted yield curve. There are other yield curves that I study. I won't talk about them in this video. I cover those more in my classes, but this can be a really helpful tool for you to use. Since currentmarketvalue.com uses the 10 to the 3, that's what I focused on for this video. So what is the conclusion? What can we take from this? The yield curve model on the current market valuation website is at fair value. Other stock market valuation measurements 
show that the S&P 500 is overvalued, and I cover that in other videos. We can conclude from this, you don't necessarily need to freak out right now. Oh my gosh, let's sell everything, let's predict doom and gloom. There are people out there doing this. They may be using other tools than what we're talking about here, but there's a lot of doom and gloomers out there. Just like there's a lot of people that think that we're just going to continue to go up and up and up. Each one of those is unrealistic. We need to come to our own conclusion about what we think is going to happen, have a plan in place before things even do happen. Through our analysis, we then see what's happening and then make adjustments. So however, it's necessary to have a plan developed and in place in case the market environment changes. That's where people get hurt. They just kind of hold on hoping that things are going to stay good because most people just buy low and sell high and that's all they do. Well, there are periods of time when we go sideways and when they really get hurt is when we go down and people are freaking out and they're worried about losing their retirement. They're worried about their investment portfolio decreasing in value and that's a legitimate concern even though there are tools that you can implement to take care of that. But most people don't know about those things. What we need to do is right now say, okay, what if the market environment changes? What are we going to do? Am I going to sell? Am I going to hedge? Am I going to take advantage of things going down? These are things that every person needs to ask and then answer for themselves. If other measurement tools suggest a major change in trend from up to down, as I record this, that's what's happening. We just hit an all-time high with the S&P 500 right before I started recording this video. Is that going to happen again? We don't know. Have we hit the all-time high and we're not going to see that for years to come? We don't know. But right now, the overall trend has been up for quite a while, really since 2009. We've had some pretty significant declines. We had the plunge going into the COVID-19 pandemic, but the market has really recovered since then and has been doing really well. Now, there's other reasons for that that I address in other videos. We're just looking at the price of the S&P 500 and then the yield curve model for this particular video. So if we implement other measurement tools and we suggest, oh man, things are not looking good here. We're opening up the hood of that car. We see the engine. The car looks nice on the outside, but there's some real big problems on the inside. If we conclude that, what we need to do is implement a plan. Well, before you can implement a plan, you actually have to have a plan. And this will be in order for those who have long positions. That means you might become more defensive. You implement hedging. You use some options. You might sell some riskier investments. You take a more defensive strategy at that point. Or if you are a person who participates in short positions, which means you make money when the value of that asset goes down, you're short selling or taking advantage of short instruments. That's when you become more offensive. So you play both sides. You take advantage of up markets and you take advantage of down markets. The idea is to just be ready at all times. You may come up with a plan that doesn't kick into gear for a long time. Use that time right now to develop a plan that works for you because things will change. There are cycles in the markets and instead of freaking out and being all concerned about things, you come up with a plan now and say, if these things happen, then I will implement this strategy. And sometimes you can even make money during those times. So thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. I really appreciate that. Please click the like or dislike. Leave any comments below. Also, please consider subscribing to this channel. That will really help things grow. There's also the free workshop that I talked about at the beginning of this video. There's a public Facebook group that you can join. And I also have a blog at spxinvestingblog.com where I post articles. So thank you very much and I'll talk to you in the next video.